Let's go to the ancient Spanish monastery. It's Florida's oldest building, built in 1141. But there is a catch, and you'll have to hang on to hear how an old world structure from 1141 is located in North Miami Beach. Travel across America with me. Don't feel tricked. It is truly Florida's oldest building, but there is a catch. The museum is incredible. We spent as much time in the museum as we did walking through this gorgeous old world monastery and as a bonus treat since we're talking about Europe and Spain I'm going to take you to the bistro that we went to it's a little bit of London it's the Vienna Bistro. You'll have to wait till the end of this video to see the beautiful pictures from where we had coffee the day we visited the ancient Spanish monastery. And now, details about the monastery. It's spectacular. Built in Spain in 1141, this is what happened. William Randolph Hearst, you know who that is, right? He purchased the monastery. He had it taken apart stone by stone and shipped to the United States. It finally ended up in North Miami Beach. It's located on the West Dixie Highway, but it took a bit. The building is more than 400 years older than some of the National Historic Monuments in St. Augustine, and I have done quite a few videos on St. Augustine. Look in the links below. The grounds are beautiful, and the building is amazing. Let me take you through. It has become a popular place for weddings and special ceremonies. Church services continue to be held on Sundays and Wednesdays. When we were there, we met the president of the foundation, Marjorie. She is also an assistant lay minister. She was very kind. Each year, the ancient Spanish monastery opens its doors to over 50,000 visitors to experience the monastery's extraordinary Romanesque and pre-Gothic architecture. And that is why I wanted to go there, because I love architecture, especially old world architecture. And this literally is old world architecture because this structure is from Spain. The construction of the monastery and the cloisters of St. Bernard de Claval began in Sacramentia, Spain in the year 1133, nearly 360 years before Columbus set sail for the New World. Completed in 1141 AD, the monastery was originally dedicated to the Virgin Mary and named the Monastery of Our Lady, Queen of the Angels. It later became St. Bernard de Clairvaux. Well, now let's hear a little bit about William Randolph Hearst and what his role played in this building. In 1925, William Randolph Hearst purchased the cloisters and the monastery's outbuildings. The structures were dismantled stone by stone, bound with protective hay packed in some 11,000 wooden crates numbered for identification and shipped to the United States. I know of two bridges, the famous London Bridge in Arizona, and there is a bridge in a subdivision north of San Antonio that was disassembled and brought across the pond and reconstructed here in America, back to this ancient Spanish monastery. When the crates arrived, hoof and mouth disease broke out in Segovia, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, afraid of possible contagion, quarantined the shipment upon its arrival, broke open the crates, and burned the hay, a possible carrier of the disease. And unfortunately, the workmen failed to replace the stones in their original numbered boxes before moving them to a warehouse. Can you believe it? Soon after the shipment arrived, financial problems forced most of Hearst's collection to be sold at auction. The stones remained in storage in New York City for 26 years. Isn't this crazy? In 1952, one year after Hearst's death, they were purchased by William Edgman and Raymond Moss for use as a tourist attraction. It took 19 months and almost $1.5 million, it's over $13 million in today's currency, to put the cloisters back together in what Time Magazine called the world's biggest jigsaw puzzle. The saga continues. In 1964, due to financial difficulties, the cloisters were put up for sale. Colonel Robert Pentland, Jr., a wealthy philanthropist and benefactor of many churches, purchased the cloisters for the Episcopal Diocese. Some of the major items in the collection, the hymnarium, it's over 800 years old, and the this large hymnarium, which is a hymnal or collection of hymns, was hand-painted. Juices of berries were used as ink. Manuscripts are among the most common items to survive from the Middle Ages and are also the best surviving specimens of medieval painting. The Spanish strong boxes are iron-bound strong boxes that were used for storing valuables in the 16th and 17th centuries. They have large, complicated locks on the underside of the lid. The knight's armor was part of William Randolph Hearst's collection, and 
this is a Prussian armor from the late 1600s and is made of the style of the Knights Templar. So not everything in the museum has to do with the monastery, but it is an amazing collection, as you can see. This is a family confessional that dates from the mid-1800s and bears a royal coat of arms. The Pope's Cabinet is a hand-carved walnut cabinet that was used by Pope Urban VII between 1644 and 1652 to store his personal clothing. It is decorated with the papal seal and the Bernini family crest, which is three honeybees and the sun. Have you hit the subscribe button yet? Next, we're out in the gardens. Originally used as the entrance of a Spanish nobleman's home, the Iron Gate is hand wrought and weighs over 2,000 pounds. The nobleman's silhouette is shown at the top and the stone above the gate is dated 1141, the year the monastery was completed. You can take a walk through the garden and the monastery garden has been reconstructed with nearly a thousand plants and trees of various types covering 15 acres. And this is where we met Marjorie. She was out working in the dirt. Now at the South Cloisters above the entrance door, the monastery was originally dedicated to the Virgin in the bas relief Mary is crowned by angels. She stands above a castle flanked by lions, which represents the provinces of Castile and Leon. Along the cloister walls are small carvings on the stones, like the hallmarks of silversmiths. These are stonemason marks carved by the completion of each stone. Various signs, stars, wheat stalks, crescents were used to identify each mason. And then there's the coat of arms of St. Bernard de Clairvaux, who was canonized as saint in 1174. The monastery was renamed in his honor. The marble shield shows the coat of arms of King Alfonso the seventh. And in the east cloister, you'll find a statue of Alfonso the eighth. It's a life-size statue of young Alfonso the eighth the grandson of King Alfonso VII. The monastery was completed during his reign. The granite well and the cloister's courtyard was made from the capital, which is the decorative top of a second century Roman pillar. The baptismal font is 880 years old. The monastery floors are the original floors. The original floors were rubble, packed down to concrete hardness by the monks' feet for centuries. The floors were rolling and uneven, and their contours still can be traced on the base stones. The small iron bell outside the entrance to the chapel is the dining bell that was used to call the monks to meals. The original chain and clapper have been lost and replaced. The chapel today was originally the monastery refector, or a dining hall. The sit on the window closest to the altar is the smoke of cooking fires in the original monastery kitchen, and the marble relief of the chapel is a bas relief depicting the visit of the Magi that was sculpted out of white Italian marble. The three kings are shown offering their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the Christ child. It is dated around the mid-1600s. The 12th century stained glass windows above the altar are two of the three only known telescopic windows from the medieval period in existence today. I don't know about you, but I think this is so fascinating, this old world architecture. The 12th century statue inside the chapter house is said to have been carved by one of the early monks. The small alcove in the wall was used for holy water and the statue of Christ the King. And then there's the French altar facade. The ornate 18-foot arch framed and ornate 18-foot arch framed the altar. It was cored in France. The stone was kept wet to be carved and the wet stone was so soft it was worked with carpenter's tools rather than the mason's maul and chisel and hardened when dry. It's a magnificent soapstone carving that surrounded the niche for the French altar. The French altar can be seen through the iron gates and is an unusual three-legged altar from the medieval period. On the top is a square space where relics of saints were preserved. The altar and its facade were gifts from the mother house in the 14th century. A life-size statue of King Alfonso VII, who started construction of the monastery as a thank offering for a successful defeat of the Moors in a major battle. The statue of King Alfonso VII. He was considered a tall man. He was only five foot four. He's my height. Hey, I feel tall now. He is the one who started the construction of the monastery. The monastery holds several distinct designations. It is a National Wildlife Certified Habitat. It is on the National Register of Historic Places. And it is a Dade County historic site. This is a Romanesque bas-relief sculpture of a nobleman on an architectural medallion from the late Middle Ages ages. The livery collars were worn by the nobleman. This cabinet belonged to the Ortega family of Barcelona and was painted by a disciple of Raphael. The panels are oil over copper and have never been restored. This cabinet was used to store articles of faith circa late 1500s. Simply incredible. This is a refectory table, the two-inch thick 
three plank top has cleated ends and a square shaped and chamfered trestle which supports sledge feet and is joined by a central stretcher made of oak with minor period restorations circa 1350 to 1425 a.d refectory tables such as this were used for dining in monasteries in medieval times i'm telling you this collection in this museum is beyond belief i don't know where you could see such a wonderful collection of such great stuff and this is in north miami so when you go to florida and you're in miami Miami. It's not all about the beach. Go see this place. It's incredible. This is a lion fountain, circa 1200 to 1280 AD. This is a pair of Gothic Touchere candlesticks, hand wrought iron, circa 1133 to 1141. These candlesticks are a significant and rare survival of Romanesque metalwork. Their exquisite and detailed decoration demonstrates the expert artistry of 12th century craftsmen. My point: the things that people did centuries and centuries ago, and then look look at what we built today. Um, doesn't make sense, does it? This old world stuff is so incredible. Housed with the monastery church in Sacramento, Spain, until they were brought to the U.S. by William Randolph Hearst in 1923, these candlesticks adorned the high altar during the celebration of Mass. This corbel resume is from the Gothic period, circa 12th to 15th centuries. Hand-carved hardwood pediment completed with foliate carving. In architecture, a corbel is a piece of stone jutting out of a wall to carry weight. It was a popular architectural feature in early medieval churches, particularly in Romanesque buildings, in which the corbels were carved and elaborately ornamented with carved figures, as in these two examples. I hope you're enjoying this. I was so enthralled when we were there. It's just incredible. Have you subscribed? Toward the end of the Gothic period, wood carving reached its zenith. The choir stalls, wood screens, roofs, and retables of England, France, Spain, and the Teutonic countries have an execution, balance, and proportion never been equaled. Exactly what did I just say? We just can't do what they used to do. The style of design used during the Gothic period owes much of its interest to the now obsolete custom of directly employing the craftsman. Said well, part of William Randolph Hearst's collection, this Prussian armor is late 1600s and made in the style of the Knights Templar, officially sanctioned by the church in 1129. The Knights Templar were warrior monks and flourished under the patronage of Bernard of Clairvaux, the leading churchman of the time and nephew of one of the original nine knights. A medieval suit of armor was extremely expensive to produce because it had to be tailor-made to fit exactly. I always wondered about that. I mean, how did that fit right? I don't know how that could be comfortable, do you? Any incorrect sizing would be dangerous as it could hamper the knight's ability to fight. The knight's suit of armor was also a status symbol weighing approximately 50 pounds. That's what I was thinking. These things were heavy. These iron-bound strong boxes were used for storing valuables in the 16th and 17th centuries with large complicated locks on the underside of the lid. The chests are very heavy and made of iron bands with a very elaborate sequence of tools and keys to open the lid. Rather than a system of two or more separate keys, there is a sequence that must be followed exactly. Ooh, a little bit of intrigue here. The cloister, shown in yellow, and the refractory, shown in blue, have been relocated here to North Miami Beach. So now you know what we've been looking at. The door on the West Range has been relocated to the right, and the refractory, the current day chapel, shown in blue has been relocated to the left. All right, so we mixed up this jigsaw puzzle. This Renaissance chalice is one of the greatest treasures of the ancient Spanish monastery. Oh boy, can't wait to read this. This is one of the greatest treasures? After all we've seen, it is part of a group of objects that were purchased from William Randolph Hearst's private collection after his death in 1951. The cup began life as a status symbol for a nobleman's table during the reign of James I and most likely was forged in London. It is dated 1617. Four centuries ago, a mystery craft Craftsman fashioned nearly one kilogram of silver bullion into a feasting cup for a high-ranking nobleman, ornamented with astonishing detail. This chalice was crafted in the style of typical English workmanship of the period. Renaissance drinking cups from this period in England are rare, and only a few pieces survive. Most were melted down as fashions changed. Mm, we must appreciate our past, must appreciate history. This one most likely survived by being donated to a church and used for dispensing Eucharist wine during the celebration of mass. This was super gorgeous, super amazing, fantastic, um, beautiful. This horse-drawn wagon was used in the early 1600s as a caisson or hearse to take the dead from the church to the cemetery for burial. Note the ornate spindles, which held laced ropes to allow the body to slide on and off the caisson. I hope when they wanted it to. In the 17th century, the common man and woman were usually buried in an unmarked grave and without a coffin. The body perhaps wrapped in a shroud composed of woolen material 
if one could be afforded. When a coffin was used for the poor, it was only for the purpose of conveying the corpse from the house where the death took place to the graveside. There, the body would be removed and placed in the grave, covered only by the shroud or winding sheet. You can still just rent a casket today. And along with the uh, armor, here are some helmets. Ah, quite the fashion statement. I guess it saved their life. The Great Helm was the typical helmet used by the Crusaders and by the Templars in particular for the whole duration of the Crusades. The pointed helm would allow direct blows to be bounced off the helmet as opposed to taking the full impact. Makes sense, doesn't it? This helmet has a conical top, is known as Sugarloaf Helm. In Spanish, they are all called Yomo de Zaragoza, referring to Zaragoza, where they were introduced for the first time in the Iberian Peninsula. The cross on the face was used to denote the knight's affiliation to the army of God. Not sure what this guy is. He's got like forks popped out of his head. I think it's just decoration, but simply gorgeous. I, I just love this place and I hope you can go sometime. This painting is the burial of Count Orgaz. The original painting is ginormous. I thought that was my work. The burial of the Count of Orgaz measures in at over 15 feet by a 11 feet. This fine art copy was reproduced on the tile by F. Akernan. This is a group of three bronze bells from the 7th to 14th century. From the Dark Ages and from medieval Europe. Astounding. I just don't know what words to say. Leave a comment below if you can come up with a better statement. This is a rare medieval ecclesiastical open work cross that was a finial or decorative top on a monk's staff circa 1100 to 1250 AD. The condition is very fine. And here are some medieval coins minted during the reign of King Alfonso VII. Is that the guy that was the same height as I am? Here on the back porch of the museum, we found this Romanesque arch fragment. It's late medieval Renaissance time period. I hope you are touched, impressed, intrigued, and can appreciate the beauty discovered at the ancient Spanish Monastery Museum and Gardens in North Miami Beach, Florida. Of all places, have you subscribed? If not, please subscribe. And if you have, thank you. Today, the monastery is home to the Church of St. Bernard de Claval, which has an active Episcopal Anglican congregation. Flip-flops on the ground and classic road trip. Follow me to lots of fun and exciting places.